and running violent battle. Even though it was on their doorstep for Stephen and Melanie, this was a world away. We've lived there 17 years and we've been very happy there. You never feared for yourselves no. or your children living where you lived? Never. So you weren't aware of the gang and drug culture that existed just uh, half a mile or so away from you? We were aware that there was a dispute between gangs in Norris Green and Croxroth, but that's not where we live. We don't live in them areas, so it didn't seem to affect us, did it? Mercer's gang, the Crocky crew, and the Strand gang from Norris Green had been fighting since 2004. Liam Smigger Smith was just 19, the self styled leader of the Strand Gang, who liked to star in his own YouTube videos. The hostility had peaked almost a year to the day that Reese was shot, when Liam Smith, a leading member of the Strand Gang, had been gunned down. Smith was visiting a friend in Oldcourse Prison when he got into an argument with another inmate, Ryan Lloyd from the rival Croxteth crew. Half an hour later, the teenager was killed in the prison car park. On the evening of Reese's murder, members of the Strand Gang were at the Fir Tree pub in gang law and extreme provocation because this was Crocky Crew territory. The poisonous atmosphere wasn't helped by the appearance of a young gang member called Wayne Brady. He had become a hate figure to the Crocky crew by going out with a girl from Croxteth, a beauty queen called Vicky Smart. The relationship between Vicky Smart and Wayne Brady uh, was a very dangerous romance, and both sides of the divide wouldn't have been happy with this. And it's no surprise that her house was shot up, she was threatened and intimidated, and in the end, I had to leave the area. Although Brady and Smart had since split up, they were chatting near the Fir Tree pub on the night of Reese's murder. The fact that Wayne Brady had come on to the Croxteth Cruise turf would have been seen as an affront to their honour, and it would have been their job to, to either get him off, get him out of Croxteth as quickly as possible, or shoot at him, either kill him or injure him. When the gunman turned up at the pub, Brady and his ex-girlfriend were out of sight, but his two mates and fellow members of the Strand Gang were in the line of fire. In theory, the picture was complete. The police had a prime suspect and a motive, but in practice, they had little hard evidence they could present in court. So detectives now turned to techniques straight out of a James Bond film. A secret listening device was hidden in the home of Mercer's best friend, James Yates. James Yates lives very close to this scene here. Um, and we know that he assisted him in some way, so right at the early stage of the investigation, we put a bug in his home address. And that paid dividends very early on in that we were able to establish uh, some of the key movements of uh, the individuals involved. For now, the police were only scratching the surface of the gang. So high-tech wizardry also had to be matched with good old-fashioned legwork. Dozens of witnesses were tracked down and interviewed, but here the police were confronted with a disturbing wall of silence. Despite several tip-offs, it seems many are reluctant to reveal their identities or to sign statements. Detectives say they can protect those who come forward, but not everyone here believes that. This area has seen too many shootings, and with the killer still loose, people are frightened. Without the help of the local community, there would be no justice for Reese. Frequent appeals by detectives were falling on deaf ears. I need more help in the solving of this crime. The answers to who is responsible is within the community. The best hope was for Stephen and Melanie to shame the local community into cooperating with the investigation. The grieving parents had little choice but to share their loss with the media. We're devastated. We've lost our world. Uh, the world's lost a, a good guy. My baby was only 11. <laughs> he didn't deserve this. The only reason we're here today, the only reason is because we need help. We need witnesses to come forward. We need the person who killed our son to be caught 
and brought to justice. And if their parents had any thought about our pain and what we've lost, they turn in their son or their sister or their auntie or someone must know who it is or they must suspect who it is. What we want to do is to appeal to that individual. We knew that individual was a young person. He obviously wasn't intending to kill Rhys Jones. Uh, the fact that he, he, he killed Rhys may have had some emotional effect on him. And it was important that we tried to ap appeal to those emotions to get him to give himself up. And Mel, you then made this very direct appeal on television to the parents. What, why did you do that? I just felt, how could any mother look at the, her own son knowing what he's done? You know, if he won't hand him in, she should hand him in. You know, the, the, it's got, it's, you've got to come to a point where you think, you know, it's gone too far now, you know. Just, I just don't know how she could look at him. Did you think they'd apprehend someone pretty quickly? Was that, were those your early thoughts? We would have thought that someone out there would have thought, well, you know, uh, if they knew anything, you know, they would have come forward or, you know, people who knew had done it would have come forward immediately and said, you know, that this is the person who's responsible for it. But nobody gave themselves up. And despite the heartfelt appeal, Sean Mercer was getting help not only from his gang, but from his mother. Jeanette Mercer lied to the police about the bike he was riding on the night of Reese's murder. So much for Stephen and Melanie's plea for help. But their campaign was drawing support from all over the city, including Reese's beloved Everton. We all here at Everton have families of our own and we cannot comprehend what you're going through. We appeal to anyone with any information to please contact the police. In an extraordinarily moving afternoon, Stephen and Melanie shared their grief with 40,000 fans at Goodison Park. 11-year-old Rhys Jones lost his life in a senseless act of violence which shocked the world. Greece was a fanatical Evertonian and hoped one day to follow in the footsteps of his heroes by playing for the team he loved. We are joined here today by Reese's mum and dad, Stephen and Melanie. We, we did think about not coming, but we thought that Reese wouldn't have wanted to miss the game, so you know, we decided that you know, we, would, we would come to that game. As traumatic and, you know, uh, Heartbreaking it would be, we, you know, we decided that you know, we needed to come. First of all, I couldn't believe that how strong the family were when I met them and I, and I had a chat with them. You know, I, I felt as if I was in tears for them because, uh, you know, the words I said certainly couldn't comfort them in any way. How are you, Steve? Hi, David. How are you? Nobody wants to have their, their son taken away from them and we don't want shootings. How are you doing? Yeah, not so bad. Hi. Uh, He's, uh, Getting through, feeling any better? Yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously been a tough time. Initially, when we came back to Goodison, uh, it's you're looking for him, you're looking for his hand, hold his hand, because there's a lot of people around. You know, when the uh, the match finishes, and you know, you'd be looking around, looking for somebody's hand to hold. You know, when you're a kid, there are there are dangers out there. You know, getting run over. You know, stuff like that. You know, getting shot shouldn't be one of them. And it's just it's just totally wrong. Despite Stephen and Melanie's best efforts to encourage witnesses to come forward, the lack of information from the local community continued to hamper the investigation. The police were desperate for a first-hand account of Sean Mercer's movements on the night Reese was shot. They needed someone to betray their mates. But who? It's very, very difficult to get people to give evidence. The witness knows he'll have to go on the run or onto a witness protection programme, probably for the rest of his life. Teenage gangster Sean Mercer was the prime suspect for the murder of Rhys Jones. He'd already been arrested but was released due to a lack of evidence. The young thug was strutting around his home turf of Croxteth, seemingly untouchable. Unbeknown to Mercer, the police had infiltrated his gang by planting a bug in the home of his best friend, James Yates. The bug revealed that immediately after the shooting, Mercer had gone to the house of a 15-year-old boy, known for legal reasons as Boy M. 
When questioned by police, Boy M provided crucial information. Boy M said that within half an hour of the shooting, um, Mercer had gathered together um, associates and members of his gang and had put in train a systematic effort to dispose of evidence. According to Boy M, Mercer had plotted the cover-up from his house. Mate, I'm here. I need you down there now. First, James Yates and Nathan Quinn came round. Then it was the oldest gang members, Melvin Coy and Gary Kayes. Various other members of his, his gang have, have come to assist him in getting rid of the bike, the gun, and the clothing he was wearing at a particular time. It was clear that Mercer assumed he was above the law. No one would ever dare reveal his movements in the aftermath of the murder. That was certainly true of his gang, but Mercer made the mistake of allowing himself to be seen by Boy M's mother. Come on, come on! What's going on? From Boy M's house, the gang travelled to an industrial unit where Melvin Coy worked. Here, Mercer was washed with petrol to remove any residue from the gun. His clothes were then set on fire. They're very forensically aware. They read court reports. They talk to the older gangsters on the estate about how to beat uh, police forensics. So, for instance, when they've discharged a firearm, they know that they've got to get rid of the traces of gunpowder on them, so they'll wash themselves down in petrol. They might have been careful with the gunshot residue, but the police were still able to pinpoint the gang's movements. Now they knew what to look for, they tracked down CCTV footage of Melvin Coy's car en route to the industrial unit, and records from the gang's mobile phones proved they had been in the same area. The police were not there yet, but behind the scenes, the case was slowly coming together. Rhys was shot dead as he walked across a pub car park in Liverpool six months ago. Since in public, though, detectives could not acknowledge their progress and the pressure was growing to charge Mercer. He's Liverpool's most wanted, his name common knowledge on Merseyside. Yet six months after Rhys Jones was shot dead, no one has been charged with his murder. But as the weeks passed and there were no charges, was that very frustrating for you? And I know it must have seemed to a lot of people that there was nothing going on and it was all very quiet and there was a lot of people saying, you know, why isn't there being more arrest or why isn't this person being charged? But to us, we knew a lot was going on and we knew how delicate and fragile the whole case was. The other thing with Dave is that uh, he was obviously under a lot of pressure, not only from people above him, but the people in Liverpool wanted these people caught. But He'd always ask us if we were happy with what he was doing and, and where it was going because at the end of the day, you know, he was saying that, you know, uh, he's doing it for us, he's not doing it for anybody else, he's doing it for, for us and if we're happy then, you know, he'll continue doing, doing what he's doing and he'll go at his own pace and he'll, he'll get it right, which is the most important thing. Because the worst thing would have been, you know, if he'd arrested him too early, you know, the charges may not have stuck or, you know, it might have got to court and it, they might have been convicted, you know, it's, it's a waiting game, isn't it? And, you know, you've got to get it right. At last, the waiting game and Stephen and Melanie's battle to persuade the community to cooperate appeared to have paid off when detectives got a crucial tip-off about the murder weapon. The police made a series of raids across the area and found two guns in the loft of an associate of the gang, known now only as Boy X. There were a number of uh, key turning points, but I would say probably the main one was when we recovered the gun that was used to kill Reese. Boy X was brought in for questioning. Boy X seemed to be very frightened. 
by what was happening to him and by the predicament that he got himself into. He described how he had...